and uh, done a lot of good works in addition to their own, you know, creative output, <coughs> editing jobs and presence in the literary community. But sometimes we go into our own little places and do our thing, and we forget that there is a community out there, and they put a lot of labor, a lot of, you know, good, 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 good hurt into sustaining this, and sometimes that goes History is always very, very nice, and especially these years. And uh, so we know we're welcome now when the nation is going or not going. And uh, you know, it's uh, funny how said in the reference to the collection that puts focus back on the white male graphic distortion of vision begins in vocational result. Uh, not to call names, male, female, but it's a matter of historical fact. Certain things happen <coughs> at a descriptive level, that's what happens. And the distortion of vision that creates a lot of problems for all of us because that knowledge that we can move forward. So, this is a very, very strong book, beginning with history territory. For, and uh, Gloria, you know, she's done a lot of uh, <laughs> labor and good stuff. In the of the editor, she's done a lot of press, published a lot of good, good books. You know, and uh, she's so dear, and very dependable. A whole lot of razzmatazz out there, but <laughs> let's keep going. You know what you're getting. And, um, so, the books that she had brought about brought on the whiteness of home is here, and she'll be reading from that. And uh, so, I think we are in for a good evening. And, uh, so, Kevin, why didn't you? Thank you. Everybody for coming, some old friends, some new friends, and uh, a lot of folks that I hope to become new friends. Uh, thanks for coming here to help me celebrate uh, my, my new book. Um, it's great to be doing it uh, with uh, with Gloria, who I sort of met here uh, in 1991. I came in here with my pal Mike Bazooka to try to get Louisa to sell my magazine that I had at the time, uh, which she said yes to, and she did, and she sold it here. Um, and over in the corner was this little tin box. My friend Meg was like, what is that? And uh, Louisa said, open it up. And it was uh, it was her magazine of poems that was, uh, was in the tin, tin box. So we got a fun guy. This is really cool. <laughs> and uh, we've been doing this stuff in parallel since, since at least then. Uh, thanks to Gorley for hosting me. Thanks for uh, Elizabeth and Ippiani. Especially thanks to Ippiani because I, I had this moment where I had the balls to uh, send him a very early draft that I would never show to that many people and uh, the guy read the whole thing and uh, took me out to lunch and helped me shape it to make it a lot better so anything that you like about this book it's his give him the credit anything you don't like uh, it's it's still my uh, still my fault and I, and I have to thank my wife who's here uh, it's hard to be married to a poet uh, the first poem uh, also a lot of this I did in the, in the archives of the Library of Congress and uh, Boston Athenaeum and Massachusetts Historical Society, and my publisher, I should say, this is published by Mad Hat Press out of North Carolina, and when he read it, he had the great idea. Thank you, Mark, he's out in Western Mass, too far away. Thank you for, for publishing this book, but he said, gosh, uh, do you think you could get permission to uh, juxtapose the work with a lot of prints and engravings from the period? So we delayed publication for six months, tried to get all these permissions. And so inside the book, it, it has these great, uh, great engravings um, alongside a lot of them and this engraving here is an engraving of a, a woman next to a power loom in um, in, uh, in Lowell, Massachusetts. So the first poem is called Pirating the Power Loom, Francis Cabot Lowell to Nathan Appleton, 1813. I stole their designs with my own two eyes. I smuggled them to Boston in my mind. Exporting designs meant jail in Britain workers of looms weren't allowed to leave, so I snuck into Manchester myself. I made it back two days before the war. I saw iron cards and spinning jennies. 
I watched Luddites spin and weave all alone while looms marched in teams and didn't rest. I said to myself, this has to come home. My baggage was searched twice at Halifax. They didn't find drawings of their machines. I sketched it all out in my memory. I had their designs in my mind. And while I was here. <laughs> Beginning of the Industrial Revolution in the United States is a function of Francis Cabot Lowell, a Boston merchant who saw that we were about to go, war, go to war in 1812 and therefore there would be no supply of clothing or cotton in the United States. But all he needed was the power loom. So he went there and he said, show me this incredible stuff that you had. He had a photographic memory, he memorized the designs, and we built power looms, the first one in Waltham by this guy Moody, if you go out to dinner in Moody Street in Waltham. It's named after Paul Moody, the engineer who, uh, who Lowell uh, shared with him his photographic memory, they created this thing. There wasn't enough water in the Charles, and they figured out that uh, up in the Merrimack, the waters are a lot, uh, a lot faster. It's white slavery. This poem's called Removal Act, 1830. Maize, beans, squash, the three sisters, rabbit, deer, fish, pots, baskets, clothes. Trade you skins and fur, otter, lynx, fox, for knives, axes, muskets, gunpowder, and scarlet ribbon. We need the unused lands. Master the arts of civilization or go west of the Mississippi. Alabama, half of Georgia, western Tennessee, the Creeks, Cherokee, Chickasaws, a trail. Horses and oxen standing up in the mud, stiff and bones. One wagon for every 50, for children, for elders, for the rest of us on foot in tears, bayonets at our backs, disease ahead. Uh, so Lowell becomes the industrial powerhouse of the United, of the United States, and Massachusetts becomes the, the cornerstone of the United States Industrial Revolution. And one of the things that Lowell saw when he went to the UK is that they had all these unions that struck all the time and would throw the Luddites that would mess up the machines. And so his ingenious idea was, I'm going to get women to work in these places. All these women are surplus labor in the farms in New England. And if you take five to ten of them off the farm, it's still going to keep productivity the way it is. It might even actually improve productivity. So I'm going to take them and tell them, hey, you can come live in the city. And, and Lola, you can go out at night and drink. We're going to give you some money. You can meet some men. You can have some fun. And we'll tell their dads, hey, we're going to send money home. We're going to keep an eye on your daughter. Um, and so it was a perfect symbiotic relationship, and uh, these women work in a strike, and you didn't have to pay them anything like you needed to, needed to pay, pay the men. Um, and I discovered, Columbus style, uh, this woman poet named Lucy Larkin, um, who was a worker in the Lowell Mills up there. And uh, all the women there had their own literary magazine called The Lowell Offering. And she wrote a book of poems called The Idol of Work that became you know, semi-famous in the Boston area in the 1800s. And it got her known well enough that she quit the mills and she was a so, sort of a secretary and assistant to John Greenleaf Whittier when he uh, in the magazine. Both my shoulders, then lashed a rope three times around my chest. I was dragged through Wilson's Lane to State Street to the spot of the Boston ma Massacre. They tore off my clothes, they kicked my face. The light of day did not cause them to care, so the mayor jailed me just to keep me safe. Another day devoted to thy cause, not till war is over will I pause. Well, all this changes. Uh, we, there's this big compromise in 1850 where um, uh, there's new territories, Kansas and Nebraska, and uh, there's a big conflict between the North and the South. This is all history you learn, you learn in your books. but. Uh, um, and the deal is, Kansas and Nebraska, those folks can decide if they're going to be pro-slavery or, or if they're going to be free. Um, and in exchange for that, you weirdos up in Boston and in the North, if you want to have slaves, if you want to be free, go ahead and be free. You don't have to have slaves. But you're going to have to pass this thing called the Fugitive Slave Act, which says, if my slave from Virginia goes to Boston and we get him, we get to take him home. And uh, that was the compromise. It's called the Compromise of 1850. 
Um, and the Lowell and Lawrence families were putting their cash right behind that to keep that all set, to keep that cotton flowing up to Boston and keep it all quiet. So even though we're really well known for being a bastion of abolitionism and social justice, uh, the major interest groups here were, uh, were not in line with that and were a key wall behind any real progress until Anthony Burns, a uh, slave from Alexandria, and I, I was in Alexandria when I wrote a, a big part of this book where we lived uh, a couple years ago. Uh, Anthony Burns was a slave from Alexandria who escaped to Boston, uh, who was, just, you know, they caught him and uh, found him under the Fugitive Slave Act and, uh, and walked him home and, and sent him back home to slavery. Anthony Burns, Boston, May 24, 1854. I didn't want to make myself known. I didn't tell who I was. I got employed. I came to work. I worked hard. I kept my own counsel. I strove for myself. I didn't say I'd been a slave. I was going home one night. I heard someone behind me. I felt a hand on my shoulder. I heard cannons, I think from the common. I hear because the Nebraska bill just passed. Stop, stop. You're the fellow that broke into the silversmith shop. I said he was mistaken. So the last poem is called The Last Full Measure of Devotion. My sword got stuck between his ribs. I kicked my foot into his chest. I pulled it out with both hands. In the same motion, I swung right into the gut of another. He hit the ground. I grabbed his colt. I shot one who was charging me with a rifle and bayonet soaked with blood and blue cloth. Without support of any kind, Captain said, retire by prolonged so McGlivery could fill the gap. We went quiet when he said, hold position at all hazards. I thrust my sword even harder into a Mississippi thigh as he tried to kick it from my hand then go after our best gunner. I used rammer heads. I used hand spikes. I kicked him in the groin. I kneed him in the face. Then I shot him in the stomach. There was so much smoke around me. I didn't know their numbers. Too many Barksdale sharpshooters, too many South Carolinans, too many 21st Mississippis, too many rocks for our wooden wheels, too many dying men and horses to move our Napoleons back. We saw Bigelow get shot twice, but the bugler took him to the rear. We kept on trying to fight. I got stabbed twice in the ankle. I felt the shell go into my side, but my eyes were wide open when he died. Thank you. asked many times, um, why do you write about atrocities and genocide? It's so dark, how can you write about this? And my answer is strictly, it's I have to. I have to be a voice for those that don't have a voice. And that's the reason for this book and some of my other books. And I'm going to start out, um, I forgot to mark my pages, but I have a list. <laughs> Um, I read in the Hastings uh, reading series a little while ago, and I read with a writer named Brother Nicholas. And um, after the reading, you know, we started to talk, and uh, Huey and Tim uh, were with me, and he told me I was a light in a dark world. So I thought, hmm, poem material. <laughs> so um, that's how this first poem was um, born. In a dark world for him. You told me I was a light in a dark world. Hanging on to these words, I continue. Every day there is slaughter, murder, horrific things done to a body, things that make me sick. Day after day, death happens, despite the sun coming out to show the blue of the sky, beauty and ugliness in battle, light and dark in battle, each day a tug of war, and each day each side wins somewhere in the world. You told me I was a light in a dark world. Why did you do this? Do you know something I don't? Am I an angel alone weeping with words coming out of my mouth that no one listens to? Standing in line, I think nothing of it. 
deciding what to devour for lunch, a decision finally reveals itself to me. Like a stargazer, I stare at the menu against the wall. How lucky I am when others are not. Their shadows speak, making it difficult for me to eat. These murmurings, forces, cry in my head. I answer back every day. Collapsing quietly, sadly. It is politics why you starve. It is the big men with a circle of violence around them splattering the people, murder on the world's hands. Picking up the food with my hand, poems I call my Maria poems, and she's like a saint to me, and she kind of represents that in many of my poems, because back in 1980, I worked with a little girl who was nine years old who fled um, from El Salvador, and she basically uh, climbed into a pit on top of her mother's body and faked dead so that she wouldn't get shot. And um, so even though this poem isn't about that, um, you'll see that I use her name. Uh, again, like I said, as almost a city figure. Maria's uncle. Maria had his guts in her hands, tried to push them back into his body, thinking it would save him. She couldn't. Screaming into her palms, his intestines touched her lips. She cried such sorrow, the abyss shook. Now Maria travels the world speaking about the dead, telling the world it is hopeless that no one is capable of a quiet tongue. With outstretched hands, she handed everyone a flower, said, you must water it to live, but if not, the depths of hell will assign you a seat. The poem came out of that. Tree. I cannot look at trees anymore. All I see is a finger, a lung, hearts, and intestines hanging from the branches. The soldiers tried to scare me into mercy. There are no leaves to notice. Even though I survived, my sight sees my village, friends, family hanging. On one finger was a ring, my husband's. I knew he was gone. I stumble now in this life petrified of trees. Once they gave me shade, fruit, but now only sorrow, grief. I can't walk past them now without thinking of rain, without thinking of black, without thinking of an endless abyss. Listen. The soldiers fire into the people, grabbing women and young girls, shoving bottles where no bottles should be. The soldiers beat them until lips are cracked, rape them again. There is no boundary not broken. The stories travel from country to country. The world says there is no proof. So many died without a burial or a casket. So many died in pits unaccounted for. Can't you hear their weeping around 2 a.m.? How can you sleep? How can you, when the world holds such a stench, holds so many bones? Seem to hold on to the earth. The wreckage looks like a nest for some wild beast. Only those left, the witnesses, the living, feel the pain, cry, covering hearts with hands, bow heads. Their sounds are loud. Many spirits descend on this sun-streaked day that turned cloudy. Hope was abandoned in the bloody quantum of Moses. And uh, this poem came out of it. And the very last stanza is pretty much a quote from the book Worse Than War by Daniel Jonah uh, Golden Eagle. Rwanda interview. How do I shake hands with the mass murderers to get an interview? Knowing that those hands swung a machete, slaughter in motion. The Hutu annihilating the Tutsi, a well-planned elimination. So many, so many times this happens, I stand silent, overwhelmed, frustrated, falling, and there is no stopping it. While my body betrays me with a heavy anger, the angel waits, plays a harmonica, weird. I thought I would hear a harpsichord or a trumpet. 
As my time comes closer to the end with my head in a book, I dream to start over again. The sky, gray and commanding, wants me to look at it. Then it changes to blue, then green, a force of nature with a sense of humor. Floating towards the clouds, I'll take your hand, dear angel. With one touch, the mystery will not be important. Transformed, right then, I will remember everything. And before I close, I just want to say what an honor it is to be with heaven. And thank you so much. Thanks, Massachusetts. I'm proud to call home, but it's also a lot of stuff, but the conscience of somebody you know, got agitated one day, and then the game changed. And uh, we don't have a whole lot of rifles or bazookas or tanks to fight this battle, but to the extent that we continue to bear witness, make somebody uncomfortable from the boys that do their job. So thank you both, thank you both. And uh, maybe you all have some questions or observations or questions for the board, Kevin and Victoria. I wanted to say something, ask Kevin something. Obviously you've done a lot of research and it's really good research. And I, I'm interested in You know, my red paying job is all about rationality and causality, and uh, and uh, as an artist and a poet, I don't know the answer to your question. It was just the way that I went into it, and, uh, and I, uh, I felt like I, I, I you know, uh, I, I, I started to write this book while I was uh, working in Washington, and commuting in from Virginia driving by the slave quarter place uh, where the slaves were being auctioned uh, and some of them were escaping to Lawson uh, while at the same time all the secretaries in the office I was working with were two, three hours late for work every day from Baltimore because of the riots in Baltimore at the same time. I just can't write that. The rage against the machine, take it on at, at its head and uh, 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 and uh, Charles Olson, Muriel Ruckheiser, uh, William Carlos Williams, uh, Seamus Haney are folks that I guess taught me subliminally that uh, some way to deal with the present is to engage with the past. And, uh, and, um, and I discovered everything I knew, everything in this book. I'm sure I got some stuff wrong. I'm sure there's a lot more to the story. But to me, when I grasped onto the fact, Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, what I grasped onto and discovered was, uh, I mean, first of all, I was like shocked. Uh, you know, I just never put the thing together. I've lived here in Massachusetts and uh, I've gone up to the National Park Service and, and, and gone on tours of all those loons. Oh, this is cool. And I'm, I'm an economist by training. Wow. Cool production process. Technological change. Woo! And then we try to put this whole thing together and see what we fueled at the time. But, but then what, what gave me hope during all this shit that's going on is uh, the fact that and I, the fact that, that, that these guys changed their mind. Yeah, I was going to say to Gloria, you know, um, I think that I felt like you gave pieces of uh, news reel or history and emotional voice because my son is from El Salvador. I actually went down there to get him at a very intense time. And I followed, you know, what was going on there quite a bit. But you bring it to life because it's actually a, a felt people that you can, you know, talk about it and you make your poetry. I felt it was very strong for me. It was very beautiful, very, I mean, it was tragic, but I could really feel, you know, some of those things that I knew as facts, but you know, it's, it's like they came alive again. It was, it was really very powerful for me. Thank you. Yeah. It, it, it's um, like this, see me. Um, it was very emotional for, for me working with many refugees. It was funny because then all of a sudden, you know, people started contacting me, or somebody would say, Hey, I know so and so, I think I have something to tell you. And 
you know, and it's like, God, how do I sleep at night? But it makes me feel better to do something about it so that I can sleep at night because it's so horrible. So these guys had a lot of money. So they were kind of doing this thing that maybe it was against their own rational interest. And yet, it must have come a point where they felt regarded, but their life was quite, not quite fulfilled. So that by doing this, they kind of rose to another level of fulfillment for their lives to answer to their conscience. Because once the conscience was uncomfortable with this, you can't really enjoy your wealth very much. You know, they have a saying in evil land, you know, on your journey and on the journey, that is he who has another man pinned to the ground, is also pinning himself to the ground. You can't get up to go get a drink of water. Because you want that person down there, you've got to stay with him. So there's some kind of thing that this stuff does to us. And partly through Gloria, your own poems, the, the these abuses, you know, you can't rest the moral model imagination rises up and uh, there's a zone of discomfort that affects all of us. You know, so uh, we have each other's battles to fight in a way, whether we like it or not. You know, and, uh, and I see that as an inspirational source for the poet who grapples with this. They have these figures are motivated by that. All those soldiers that did all that killing, you know, whatever happened to them. Yeah, you know, they didn't stop exploiting the workers so there's some yeah so there's some there's some level of conscience there's another one it's just sort of independent that's what I really appreciate the was a quote because she said she uh, said it's a valuable collection. It's what's the focus of the white now where its distortion of vision begins and it's occasionally resolved. But, uh, you know, for those of us white guys, we got to wake up and go to work every day. Thank you. <laughs> it's almost as if you need that distortion of vision in order to carry through with that stuff. Sometimes it's really not a tragedy of free, but a tragedy of perception. When you see the world and then you, come in, you act a certain way, and sometimes in order to accommodate yourself, then you you get so messed up, so you can get these things done. But there's only so much you can compute to sustain this level of disturbance at some point. Just put them in their pocket mm -hmm. and take them to work. Mm -hmm. you know, and then we've you know, science or Shakespeare, or <coughs> political tracts, the Communist Manifesto, mm -hmm. and so for, for workers to be self educated. Mm -hmm. The factory was a, printed there. Distributed them on the rails. In my book, I focus all on, on Lawrence, but the, the if you go up to the mills, you'll see that you know the, there's the Lawrence, the town, city of Lawrence, the city of Lowell, but in all of them, there's always there's always a couple of the big buildings which are the Appleton Mills. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, Nathan Appleton, a couple of these poems are, are letters from those two, and uh, Appleton, Wisconsin, was also mm -hmm. so the mm -hmm. Appleton mm -hmm. finance met people from Massachusetts to go there and just try it out in Cambridge and was preaching to uh, two people who had um, been enslaved and murdered their master in Charlestown. Mm -hmm. And Ed Edward Brooks, who was a student at, at Harvard, writes about, you know, Nathaniel Appleton preaching to the prisoners at Sunday and the prisoners are in the church, which was like big theater too. But so, you know, it's like, it's like goes backwards and forwards, you know, this hooking up and that. And your book's very nice because it's it's only recently that this part of the country started dealing with its slavery roots, and they haven't touched the whole thing around, you know, balloons and and that complicity, you know, with the South. So and one of the things that I found out about. Uh, my second favorite reading of this book, my first one is here, because this is the one of the all poetry bookshop in the world, and I used to crawl in here when I was a kid and be like, wow, um, is that at, I am, um, I'm going to read at the national, um, national, so the, a couple of the, um, a couple of the mills up there are national parks now, and um, they have something called the William Moses Lecture, and uh, I'm going to read in the mills. Just uh, 
totally excited to be, be right there in that. But uh, as I was reading about that museum, so that happened in the 90s, I think, is when, is when it became a national park and it refurbished the, the mills. And uh, there was a huge protest from the antecedents of the Black Lives Matter movement uh, because it didn't touch any of that stuff. Mm -hmm. you, know, you went on a tour in 1992 here in Liberal, Massachusetts and went to look at the looms, they'd say, oh, wow, we gave all these opportunities to women and we had this incredible technological innovation and they're still, they're still, they're still, if you go there now, I took my son there on uh, a couple of, a year and a half ago and uh, you watch the video, it's better than that, but it was a, actually, it was a, it was a function of uh, people protesting and articles all over the newspaper when the news came out. And, and uh, there was a small little exhibit that, that connected mm -hmm. to it, but um, one of the things that they don't admit now is the piracy of it. Mm -hmm. um, is that it's, it's literally... A question for Gloria. Yeah, I, you know, like you were saying, you you know, you, you are so drawn to atrocity and whatnot. When I was reading your poem, I really don't get a sense that you were, like, sermonizing, you know. I get a sense, like uh, Lee was sharing, that it was very powerful. And it's always a balance between events or history as well as the, the craft of poetry. Uh, in it, I hear music and I hear imagery. And then I wonder how you really struggle with the material, because here you have some event or history that you want to wrestle with. But at the same time, you have to write the poem. Mm -hmm. So how does that work for you, you know, in terms of song, image, and... and it's a struggle for me to write uh, about those things. It's like um, the stories that I hear, um, they don't know sometimes that they're giving me those images, you know, because a lot of the things that I wrote are actual, you know, some words, you know, rephrased or changed. Um, the thing I struggle with maybe a little is I want to do it justice. I just want people to feel the emotion that I feel um, so that you will, you know, maybe um, join me and speak up about it instead of, um, not doing anything or in your own way if you don't speak up about it, you know, maybe getting involved in organizations, you know, that help these people. Um, because when you think about it, how many countries, oh my God, that there are killings in? I mean, it's just, I can't even grasp it. And, you know, and sometimes, you know, when I'm writing, I mean, I don't have trouble falling asleep over it. I try to separate myself. I think if I didn't, I would be in the nut house, <laughs> you know, because especially the things that, that they say to me. So the images really come, you know, from their words, from research. Um, you know, that's how I pretty much get them. And then the words just kind of flow for me. They can't help but not to because I'm so, like, wrapped up in what they're, what they're telling me. And also the use of the voice, like you were talking about Maria. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. kind of like um, mm -hmm. using that as a way to, you know, to yeah. write a poem. Mm -hmm. And I find that, the, you know, just to have to keep the kind of balance, you know, between what happened mm -hmm. and actually the craft, you know, mm -hmm. the music, mm -hmm. the line and... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm sure Maria was, was, Maria was interesting, you know, I had to have a translator, and um, I don't know how much was lost in translating, hopefully not too much, but the gist of it is what I shared with you earlier, and, and all of a sudden I just found she's cropping up in all my poems, you know, so that's why I look at her as a saint figure almost. Um, I even put her um, as coming, you know, like uh, in general, you know, those that come over to this country, um, that don't know the language, don't know the culture. Uh, so I put her adjusting, you know, to that even in some of my poems that aren't in the book, uh, but it's in the next one. And, um, you know, so, I, you know, it's nice to have a figure kind of to carry through, you know. She's like a real, hero's the wrong word, but uh, wow, you know, to lay on top of your mother, you know, and, um, you know, all the dead. <laughs> Bodies, yeah, I just, you know, um, so I hope that answered you. Yeah. No, no, before you sit down, okay. the, uh, the, the, 
the connection between your long editorial stuff and your creative side, do you want to say a word or two about it? Because, you know, Savannah Barbara takes a lot of time to get all that stuff, and before that, so that portion of your service to the literary world and then your own creative creative work. And also, following on that question, I was thinking about that picture during the Vietnam War, the girl with ne Nepal. Oh, yeah. So very yeah. Iconic, iconic picture, mm -hmm. you know. And yeah. you get over that, I think some, some of this powerful stuff here. Yeah, yeah there, was, there was a picture in the New York Times of uh, three little boys, and they were all bloody. And when I saw that, you know, oh my God, so a poem came out of that. That was in Pakistan after a bombing. Too. So I thought, I looked at it and it just pulled here and so then the, you know, the words. Oh, the Syrian you know, bomb, the five year old, five year old Syrian bomb, yeah. Yeah, that yeah. too, yeah. And then you ask, you know, maybe how I do all that, I'm an yeah. insomniac. <laughs> <laughs> so it helps a lot because I work as a social worker by day and um, so um, at night, you know, Bill goes to bed at nine o'clock and snoring away, <laughs> and it's heaven. <laughs> it's heaven. So, you know, I, I come alive at midnight and I do some writing and I go to bed at two and get up at five every day. Wow. wow. You know? Great. And, awesome. I, and I function, I don't feel anybody. <laughs> so, you know, just Friday night usually is my night to chill, but, you know, because I feel cranky, but I don't feel cranky tonight. <laughs> I just want to say, I'm glad that you um, started the reading with um, somebody talking about the light and how you're like the light in the world, because you have to shine a light on these things. You, you have to, and I, I understand, and it's it's so painful, but um, but it is. It is a word, so th you know, thank you for, um, you know, and the thing that strikes me about your poetry is um, in the tradition of Carolyn Forche, it's really poetry. You know, I really get a sense of, when I listen to you of, you know, what poetry is. You, your works are just, um, I, I have to call them very poetic, which makes it very beautiful, even though you're talking about things that it's almost impossible to hear. Yeah. You know, but we compartmentalize things, I think. If you look at this country alone, you're gonna find police gunning oh, down yeah. innocent children in the street. I mean, so it's not just this is a worldwide phenomenon. And we're not yeah. separate from that. I mean we maybe don't have soldiers gunning us down and throwing us in ditches, but we do have very many atrocities here. We sure. have um, gays and lesbians yeah. and transgender people being beaten to death. You know, it's it's mm -hmm. here too. Sure. And um, and uh, it's it's unfortunately where humanity is now. We hope it can change. Yeah. Well, we and I wonder if it's always been there, but yeah. we're just hearing about it more because of the internet. TV and that, and then I would like to think, gee, hopefully it wasn't always like this with all this crap going on, you know. But well, it was. I, mean, I it think was it was. It's it started just slavery. yeah. It started on the genocide of the Native Americans. Yeah. Yeah. It's never ending. Yeah, but, it just never ends. But thank you for showing me this <coughs> yeah, and for coming so here much. tonight. Thank you. Uh, if you, any more question? If not, then we could uh, <coughs> try to bring this uh, again. Thank you, thank you both, you know. But remember one time. It's been a beautiful reading and things went very well. I think it was, it was Gardner and a moral fiction book uh, that the fundamental sense of the artist as he or she looks at life is one of glory obstructed a glimpsed wholeness, shattered. This thing has a sense that we're weighing you down, but we better keep our eyes on the prize of glory obstructed, a glimpsed wholeness, shattered. That's what motivates us, because we know that despite all these disturbances and fracturing, there's something, there's our hope. Thank you, Gorka. Thank you. Thank you.